welcome all. Uh, welcome to my talk about PX4 on the IMX RT 1176 1 gigahertz MCU. I guess the, the 1 gigahertz has a very nice ring to it. We finally breached that barrier. So up we, we, off we go. So uh, introduction about myself. Um, I'm Peter van der Perk. Uh, work for NXP Semiconductors in the CTO System Innovations. And uh, inside of that, we have a mobile robotics team. Uh, it's a multinational team. We are based in Netherlands, Germany, USA, Canada. And uh, what we do is we make reference designs. So NXP makes ships and our team, we're looking at, okay, how can we already think about applications for these systems? So we've made vehicle management units. NXP is quite big in, in vehicle networking. So we have CAN bus, Ethernet uh, technology. Um, last year I presented also a reference battery management system. Um, and most of our systems, uh, we try to enable open source software on that. So we run PX4, NetX, uh, Several Arts is also a new one. Um, and also one part of the mobile robotics team is uh, we organize the NXP hover game. So you see hover games thrown. Um, so that's a competition with our hardware. And then we want to engage uh, students um, working on uh, new uh, projects and think about. Um, and also we have the NXP Cup, which is a, a rover a, a platform where people can do autonomous races. So some small background about NXP and PX4. Um, so we started with the FMU K66, which is partially based on the FMU V4. It's not official, but um, that's the platform we use for the NXP Horror Games Road. Um, also, we have the UCAN SC2K1, so that is just a small uh, CAN board to uh, make CAN-enabled uh, sensors. That's also running PX4, you can check out the code and use that. And uh, last year, we also uh, showcased some uh, automotive part, which is the SC2K3, which is then a lockstep, and that's for high-integrity uh, parts, and potentially can use that for uh, gateway or for functional safety. Um, but PX4 right now has the FMU V6X standard, but we never made a drone about that, uh, a platform for that. So that's what we wanted to do uh, this year. So uh, we looked at the P Pixel Open Drone standard, particularly the DSO 12, which is then the FMU module, and then also the uh, Pixel Autopilot best standard. Um, and based on that, we made an extension where the V6X RT uh, platform uh, for our IMX RT. So instead of using utilizing the, the base processor there, uh, replace it with IMX RT. And the goal is to have a full drop-in replacement. And that's also the nice part uh, about having such a standard where we can check we're compliant to that. Um, but also we had to make a platform that, of course, is compliant and works with that. So the IMX RT1170 is luckily fast enough, has enough RAM, um, uses external flash, um, but we had to see if we can comply to all the needs. So this is just a very quick summary of the V6X standard regarding the I.O. we needed. Um, and yeah, luckily uh, the platform was, was good enough and based on that we decided to design a board with that. So a quick introduction to the V6S standard. It's, it's a big PDF, lots, lots of slides. Um, but the, if you think about in the Pixhawks 5 uh, autopilot right now, you have an IMU module, you have your F, FMU module, and you have your baseboard where people can also make their own modules. Uh, so this talk is mostly about an FMU module uh, based on the IMXRT. Um, and then we reuse the, the board connectors that's already defined. So uh, we have the same IMU uh, connector. Uh, we can use the different uh, sensor sets. And then we also implement the Pixar Autopilot bus, which is pretty much two uh, big high-rose connectors, 100 positions and 50 positions. Um, and people can also make their own custom drones with it. So this is pretty much how the Pixel V6XRT looks like. Um, if you're familiar with V6X, actually it's not much different. So we primarily just uh, changed out the, the microcontroller and did some modifications there. But the whole point is that we just have uh, a base set that's the same. Um, however, the IMXRT part we have is a, is a bigger part. So we have more spare GPOs. And also uh, when the V6X standard uh, came about, uh, the PEP still had some, some spare pins. So we also engaged with drone code and we're looking, okay, how can we extend that? 
uh, one party is actually uh, utilizing extra Ethernet pins for the communication between the Fi and the flight controller. Uh, we think that's important because right now we see with uh, companion systems or autonomy, there has to be a high data communication between the flight controller and the companion system. And we really want to know if there are errors and also if their link dies or the, the Fi uh, reports an error, we want the internet based solution and the uh, polling solution where uh, if there is a problem, it propagates to slow. Um, we're also promoting Canvas a lot. Uh, our chip has three canvases, so we really want to get that out. Um, and then also we uh, just have extra P2M channels for general I.O. Or, or data conversion. So this is pretty much how the FML module looks. Um, it's pretty much the same if people are used to, um, kind of crammed into there. It's, uh, it's a small board, so that's what people like. We want to have a, um, a small platform uh, to be used. Um, so we even put a very big external flash on it. I'm not sure if people encounter it, but uh, V6X, sometimes we cannot run all the programs we want because we have the damn flash overflow. Well, this is not going to happen anymore, so we're very happy with that. Um, and we pretty much have uh, lots of open source enabled that. So we have the base Nutix Artos running, we have PX4 Autopilot running, um, and we also have Zephyr Artos enabled. Uh, Zephyr is a complete different Artos, but what makes it interesting is um, the chip also has a secondary core, which is right now it's not used. Um, but if you think about uh, functional safety or some extra checking or have an independent checker, um, you want to have something completely different. You don't want to reuse the same operating system. So uh, that would be very interesting if the community also uh, has some ideas about that where we can have some kind of PX4 secondary core uh, checker with that. Um, so just a quick uh, wrap up about the Pixel Autopilot bus. So with that, you introduce this concept of a system or module design. So we have a separate module, and this is the, the uh, baseboard we use, but everyone can make their own vehicle baseboard. Um, but that makes it nice to, for us to rapidly prototype a new flight controller module, but that's also useful for people if they want to make their own baseboards. It's, it's well documented, it's uh, governed by uh, drone code. If you have uh, questions, you can ask them. They have reference circuits three, um, and they also uh, verify that. Um, yeah, so open points. So IMXRT 1170 is a very big chip, and we just pretty much have our own parity with the current flight standard. But what we see is that, okay, we have so much more. We would be interested if, if people already think about use cases, uh, what we can do extra. So we have a camera CSI interface, so we can potentially have a camera interface for optical flow. We can pro uh, process that. We have enough processing power for that. Um, right now, the PX4 standard is only uh, limited to 100 Mbit um, and there's also a specification for uh, time sensitive networking. So is there an industry need for that? Um, um, we have um, audio as well, we have a DAC. So if, if people kind of got sick of the beeping noise of a PX4, you know, it would be cool if we can use the DAC and just have an MP3 uh, starting up sound. <laughs> we have enough flash, so that, that would be cool. Um, and also one part is uh, we also have enough uh, SEO for uh, extra Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So the question is, is how do we want to evolve this? We, we see that the microcontrollers are uh, getting faster. Um, also from regulatory, uh, we have to have uh, open drone ID. Do you maybe want to integrate that? So I think this is for now for drone code, it would be interesting how we can look further on that. So now a bit more about the technicalities. So porting PX4 Nutix to the 1170. So we were quite lucky that um, the IMX family is actually already well supported by Nutix. And also there has been lots of application with that. The only thing is, is that we had to expand that for the 1170. Um, and then we had to implement some specialized drivers just for PX4 because they have their own use space driver. And one good remark is, um, I put it now at the bottom, and we also did it as a last point, but hard fault logging, uh, my recommendation, if you can port it to a new chip, make sure that's the first thing you got to work, because if you have crashes, you want to have logs of that. Um, but eventually we got it to work, and it was quite useful, and now everywhere we're testing, we get all the logs, and for now it seems that we don't have hard faults anymore, and it's a good stable platform. 
Um, also optimizing peaks for the 1170. So IMXRT family is a flashless chip. So what we see is that um, because the frequency of the processors is increasing, integrating the flash is, is not logical anymore also from the cost size. Um, so you see that you can have an external chip. Um, but what you see happening then is um, we have a octal flash chip, so we have an 8-bit line, and we run that at 200 megahertz DDR. So I just, like, the title of the talk is a gigahertz chip, so how do we get the gigahertz performance? Well, you can say, well, let's run from RAM. Um, well, we kind of have a problem there because PX4 is quite big. We have two megabytes, so that's not going to work. Well, we can run from flash, execute in place. That works, but then the actual performance is just going to be limited by the throughput of the flash. So then the question is, okay, can we do a hybrid approach? So this is kind of a one-on-one -on -one in computer science. Maybe people are not really familiar with it, but I'm just trying to explain some here. So the Cortex-M7 um, comes with a cache. So uh, you have which they call temporal locality. So if you just execute the function, you can still have it in your cache, and the next time you execute it, you don't have to wait to fetch it from the flash. And also the, the flash controller itself um, has some kind of prefetcher which gives you spatial locality. So if you're running from one to 10 and you're executing two, it's already gonna fetch three, so you don't have a, a performance problem there. So there are already features to make sure that's executing well. Um, but there is also something called uh, ITCM, and that's actually this is introduced in Cortex M7. So all Cortex M7 parts is going to have an instruction tightly coupled memory. So that's a piece of memory that's just low latency, typically one or two cycles. It doesn't get the cache, but if you want to run code from there, you have to manually uh, map the code. So how do we do that? Um, so what we did is we kind of look at the concept. Um, you have a flow, you get interrupted, and you can get a miss there. Um, so we started just by in putting in the interrupt service routine. So every time you have an interruption, you want to make sure that these routines, they have to be very fast, can already be executed from the tightly coupled memory. The only thing is, is that we actually have a quite big tightly coupled memory, so we only filled like 30 kilobytes of that, and how can you figure out um, the other functions you want to fill up? Well, there's one way to do that, um, and that's profiling. Um, but then there are some challenges with that as well. If you're going to profile, typically it's invasive. It's going to change your performance, and you don't get the values out of that. Um, but luckily, there is something called hardware tracing from ARM. Um, but um, if you're going to use that, typically you're going to look at more expensive J-Link uh, traces or Lauderbach. Um, but there is also a very nice open source project, which is called Obocalum, and they have an open source B3 licensed uh, trace unit. So just like PX4 is open source, we also want to have a way how we can use the, the tool chain with an open source uh, tracer. So what we did is um, we set up the trace pipeline, and we can then uh, have performance logging um, without being invasive. So we have the SWO output, you can get the data out of there. And uh, we pretty much looked at the adjacent file and based on that we pretty much figured out what the hot code is. Um, and now it's the fun part. Independently I figured out that uh, Niklas Hauser has also been working on this. So we have to meet up. <laughs> um, and he's going to give even a, a bit more in-depth talk. So I was like, well, I'm going to scrap that in my, my talk. Um, but it would be very interesting to also do some more tracing into uh, PX4 and figure out how the code paths. Uh, tracing can go quite further. You can think about uh, execution maps and uh, also it's like, why does my drone twitch? And uh, these questions are interesting to uh, be, get answered. Um, so this is the, the test flight we did with our drone. Uh, my colleague Gerald Pickler mm -hmm. has been flying a lot, so he did now already fortunately 40 flights and has eight and a half hour uh, flight. <laughs> So uh, the timeline, uh, we kind of public uh, publish a amendment to the V6X, which is the V6X-RT standard. 
using this uh, microcontroller, uh, very close to upstreaming the support. Actually, it's already on the public GitHub, but, but it's not on the, the main branch. And uh, as of now, you can pre-order the Holy Bro V6X developer edition. So it's for people that want to try out, get some flight hours in. And uh, if there's any feedback about that, we greatly appreciate it. Um, also, some future work we're going to work on is um, I just introduced that we uh, wanted to assign the extra spare pins. So we can also look at our own custom baseboards utilizing those spare pins. And also part is we want to see if we can uh, eliminate the PX4IO processor. Uh, because it's kind of keep it simple, stupid principle we want to have. And already this chip is quite complicated. So, and also one part is um, because in the automotive industry, that's quite big is then also utilizing one base T1, which is uh, the automotive ethernet, they call it as well, but it's just a two wire ethernet. Um, and especially in drones, you think about weight, uh, you want to have an interlink. Uh, we also want to promote that. Um, well, this concludes my talk. Thank you for attending. Um, this is my contact information. So if any questions, inquiries, feel free to contact me. I'm here today, tomorrow. So if you have a one-on-one, -on -one, it's always good. Um. <laughs> any questions for now? Oh. Well, actually, that's an interesting one. Um, it's already uh, part of the standard. So if I find the right slide already. Yeah, I didn't put it in here. So here we already have a, a secure element. Uh, oh, you cannot see my cursor, of course. Um, but yeah, so it's also a secure element included. Um, I have some colleagues that have been working on actually already a promotion uh, where they can use a phone with NFC, you can uh, register yourself as a flight, and then you can uh, arm the drone based on your own uh, security feature. Um, actually, the driver for the chip is now already available on NetX, and uh, hopefully the coming months, and maybe next year, we can also uh, demonstrate that part. So people are really interested in uh, security, um, authenticating uh, flights, but also authenticating parts, because what you see here is like it's a, a baseboard and a flight controller. Well, what's going to happen if people kind of swap those out? So we can also have a certificate from the manufacturer, and you can also have a full uh, secure drone. Um, this is quite new, quite early, but luckily already all V6X uh, drones are equipped with that chip, and uh, hopefully we can also expand that further. Yes? Um, so I just had a question. Um, would you be able to speak on the remote vehicle, uh, specifically the need to implement it on all the vehicles in the future uh, for that very regulation? <laughs> Um, I myself is not really involved with it, um, but we're kind of looking at the, the basic ingredients about that. So uh, we're looking at Bluetooth radios. Uh, we also have some Bluetooth radios in our portfolio, um, but it's kind of ongoing, um, but we're kind of bringing that together. And also if we can have a drone ID stored safely in such a secure element as well. Yes. Um, well, it's just uh, the UART, so it's just a UART link, and then we can just communicate with the PX4IO. So that worked, worked quite well out of the box. But we still want to get rid of it, though. <laughs> Sorry, I... Uh, this drone. Um, Gerald, do you know the weight of the, the drone we used? Oh, the, the baseboard. I think it's just comparable to a normal V6X. It's probably it's like one gram uh, difference. I don't, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you and uh, have fun uh, at the Peaks Force Summit. <laughs>